Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Tom Turner. I'm the lead pastor at Praise Family Church in Mobile, Alabama, and I am thrilled and excited that you're joining us for this very special program. We have something that we really think a lot about, and that is the church and how we relate to it. In fact, over the next few weeks, we're gonna be talking about the family business, and it's just how we relate as people of God in the church where God's planned us. We hope you'll be joining us every time. And in fact, if you'd like more information about Praise Family Church, Stay tuned at the end and we'll tell you more about how you can be more connected in what we're doing. While you're turning, getting everything ready, getting your notes out, and uh, getting ready to receive the word, before we get started, let me just do a quick couple second pitch. If you don't come on Wednesday nights and don't bring your family, please check it out. Wednesday nights are so important. We call it family night, and we have something for every person in the family. In fact, for the last couple of months, we've been having a special deal for the PFC ladies that have been meeting together, and the PFC men have been meeting together. We're going to do that again this week. Don't miss it. It's great for kids, for youth. It's a great night to come and connect with your PFC family. So we'd love to see you this Wednesday at 630. And we don't stay late. I mean, we don't make it real long, but it's a great time. All right, we're going to pick up uh, and finish, actually finish up our series called Club PFC. And today I want to talk about fathers and sons. And we're going to begin by looking at 1 Corinthians 4, 14 through 16. Paul says to the church at Corinth, I'm not writing this to embarrass you or to shame you, but to correct you as the children I love. For although you could have countless babysitters in Christ telling you what you're doing wrong, you don't have many fathers who correct you in love. But I'm a true father to you, for I became your father when I gave you the gospel and brought you into union with Jesus, the anointed one. So I encourage you, my children, to follow the example that I live before you. Let's pray. Father, we do need the blessing of heaven. We need your Holy Spirit to speak to us. We open our ears and our hearts to receive the word of God because we know that's what's going to change us. We want to be more like Jesus. Lord, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. And everybody who agrees with that, say a great big amen. 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 All right, so I found this several years ago, and I've read it here for another time several, several years back, but I thought I found this, this fits great for today. So this is actually from an a instruction manual, the Peace Corps uh, Peace Corps used to give out for volunteers going to the Amazon. So here, this is actually out of the Peace Corps Volunteer Manual. What to do in case you're attacked by an anaconda snake. And the first one is not die. Okay, so, uh, by the way, if you don't know, just it's the Earth's largest snake. They, they, can, they grow up to between 35 to 40 feet long, and they weigh up well over 400 pounds. That's a big snake. So here's what it says. How many are always ready to learn something, right? So this, this is good. If you're, going to the Anacon, uh, if you're going to Amazon, this is good to know. Okay, here you go. If attacked by an anaconda snake, do not run. <laughs> right. <laughs> the snake is faster than you are. I don't think so. <laughs> now, with somebody else, I don't have to outrun the snake, right? <laughs> Lie flat on the ground. Put your arms tight against your side and your legs tight against one another. Tuck in your chin. The snake will come and begin to nudge you and to climb over your body. Do not panic. At this point, I've decided this guy was on crack. <laughs> After the snake has examined you, it will begin to swallow you from the feet in first. Permit the snake to swallow your feet and ankles and do not panic. Because I can tell you right now, in about a five seconds, he's going to have plenty of lubrication <laughs> to swallow you the rest of the way, right? <laughs> Holy my, oh, Jesus, help us all. Anybody ready to go to South America? The snake will now begin to suck your legs into its body. <laughs> you must lie perfectly still as the, this will take a long time. You've got to be kidding me. When the snake has reached your knees, remember, you're still calm. <laughs> S 
slowly and with as little movement as possible, reach down, take your knife, and very gently slide it into the side of the snake's mouth between the edge of its mouth and your legs. And suddenly rip upward, severing the snake's head. Be sure and have your knife. That's what it says. And the last one is, be sure your knife is sharp. Okay, so here's something I've learned. It's a real important lesson in my ministry over the years. I've been doing this a long time. Sometimes I need more than a sheet of paper with a bunch of rules on it to learn what I need to know. In fact, most of the time that's the case. Because, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I read something like that, that doesn't actually prepare me to go to the Amazon. It prepares me not to go. Right? How many are with me on that? My wife, we talked about a 40-foot snake. My wife said a four-inch snake is too big. She does not like snakes. And I said something about, I said, early in the first service, I was reading part of it, and she goes, I said, I said, don't panic. She goes, I won't panic. I'll be dead. She's, <laughs> so, um, so I've learned this, and I've walked this out, that I've, I've learned that life, about the things about life and ministry and what God has us do, is better learned from as I watch somebody who loves me, who's leading me, who I'm either walking with or even literally walking behind them, watching their life. That has been so much part of my life. And so I'm thankful. I've talked about that a little bit over the last few weeks, the, the examples I've had between not just my dad, who was one of those, but some great pastors that I was able to work with, and I was just blessed with that. So I learned that to be a great leader, and I've really figured this. I knew I needed to do this, but I really got it after I became a pastor myself. And that, but to really be a great leader, you first have to be a great son, that you really have to serve someone well in order to go where God wants you to go. And that really is how the kingdom of God set up, by the way. Uh, you know, I meet people all the time who want to be leaders, and over the years, you know, I've been here coming up on 30 years, and we've had all kinds of people come here. Sometimes people come to church here, and they've served in other churches. God moves them. We're thankful for that. And we have many people who are serving here who God brought in for one reason or another, and met some who got saved here, but some God transplanted to us, and we're thankful for that. But the ones who stay typically are those who just came to serve. And sometimes people have come in and said, hey, where I was at, I was always in charge. I was the head deacon or I was leading this and I was in charge of everything. If you'll put me in charge, they may not say it exactly like this. If you put me in charge, I'll hang around. So write this down. Here's a spiritual truth. When you faithfully serve as a father, you get to partake of his anointing. So I learned there's a lot of people who want to lead, but there are not enough people who want to serve the vision of someone else in order to get there. Because what I served and thought I would serve forever, my, my goal was never to be a pastor. I didn't think I would ever be a lead pastor. I was fine serving someone else's vision. I really saw myself. I used to say it and people would laugh at me. I'm going to be the world's oldest living youth pastor. And I really had, you know, I don't know if the youth would like that, but, uh, but uh, I got to serve my time a few times here that I actually led our youth because we were between youth leaders. One time I did it for 16 months. And uh, enjoyed that a lot. But I learned that I've received all these blessings and, and uh, this anointings and things I've seen happen in my life because I'm convinced it's because of the fathers I served. Because the Bible says when we serve them, we partake of his anointing or her anointing. You know, the gifts of the prophet, right? When you serve a prophet in, in the name of the prophet, what does the Bible say? You'll receive what? A prophet's reward. So that works for all the ministry. So that's what God does with us. So that's what we need to do. If you want to be a leader, you want God to use you in a mighty way, you serve. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Right? So people ask, you know, hey, Pastor, how, how is it you got all these faithful sons? They always talk about, you know, and, and this is honestly has happened my whole ministry. People come up like right now, it's Pastor Brandon, Pastor. Now, obviously, Pastor Brandon is my, my son, uh, but, so, but Pastor Jeremy is also my son, but they're both spiritual sons as well. And people ask, how do you get these men? They're so faithful. What are you going to do when they leave? Well, God's going to raise up another son. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, it's not because I'm all that special. Don't make me say amen right there. It's not because I'm special. It's because I believe that I'm reaping the benefit of serving another father, of serving a father. And God's blessed me for that. And so I was loyal, so I, I reaped loyalty, and I, I served. And I really wasn't trying to get somebody else's job. I didn't want their job. I tried not to get their job. I even fought God about taking this job. But God had other plans. So 
We shouldn't be surprised that that's how God does things, because in the Bible, throughout the Bible, you see some really good stories about this spiritual relationship between father and son, spiritual, spiritually between fathers and sons, and that's, that's woven throughout the Bible. You ever read through the Bible? How many of you start to read the Bible, and you say, I'm going to read through the Bible this year, and a lot of times people say, I'm going to start in the New Testament. That's not a bad place to start, because sometimes if you get, start reading the Bible every day, and you get into Leviticus or one of those, you can really get bogged down. So, so I always say, it's not a bad place to start in the New Testament, but most people start with the first book, which is Matthew. Well, the very first book of the New Testament is Matthew. The very first chapter, he starts a weird language saying, and Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot, you know, Joseph, uh, Jacob, and then Jacob begot uh, Joseph, and what in the world does that mean, begot? Well, here you go. This is what begot literally means. The actual translation of begot is he gave life to. He gave life to. In other words, that's more than just breathing in and out. That's more than just having air. There are a lot of people who have given life in the sense of they've got a child somewhere. But it takes somebody special to walk out that relationship in the way God wants us to fulfill that as a father. And this isn't a Father's Day message. It's really more about the spiritual part of that. But how many of you know, if all you're doing in life is kind of breathing in and out, and a lot of people are, they've never experienced life, then you've missed so much on what God has for you. Right? How many of you know there's more to life than just breathing? It, it is, breathing is important. Anybody ever had the breath knocked out of them? I have a few times. It's scary. Ooh. By the way, how, how many, this is totally off, off the charts here, but how many remember the viral video, one of the first viral videos of a reporter that was helping do the grapes? Anybody ever seen that one? She's stomping around, she falls out, and everybody laughs at her. And I'm thinking, I've been there. That's not funny when you're like, oh, can you breathe? I can't breathe. That's terrible. Here's the, here's the deal. Um, one of the greatest examples of that spiritual relationship is Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament. Elijah was this great prophet, I mean, known as a man of God. He led the prophets, the school of prophets, we call it these days, and, and they, they learned from him, they followed him. But he had one fella following him, his name was very similar. His name was Elisha. And the way you remember which one came first is this alphabetical. J comes before S, so that, there you go, learn something really deep today. So here's the deal. Elisha served Elijah, and he was a spiritual son to Elijah the prophet. Elijah led him and taught him, and here's the deal. Really, Elisha, the way we'd say it today is he just carried Elijah's briefcase. He didn't really do anything. He just followed him and served him. He was, he was just served him. He, didn't, he wasn't like, you know, they weren't tag team preaching and things like that. I mean, he was just serving him and serving the vision God had given him. And so he serves him for 10 years, and then God speaks to Elijah and says, I'm going to, it's about time for you to come home. And if you know the story, he actually left in a fiery cherry and went to heaven without dying. That's pretty, that's pretty crazy, huh? And so he says, what can I do for you before I go? And he goes, he says, I want a double portion of your anointing. Wow. He could ask for almost anything, but he asked for a double portion of his spiritual father's anointing. And if you, if you go for, forward and follow that story, you'll find out that Elisha, Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. So God doubled his portion because he served so faithfully as a son. Can I tell you that's why God does what he does and why he calls us the way he does into a church? Come on. He called us to fulfill his purposes. In fact, write this down in your notes. God plants us in a church in the place where he wants us and sets us up. For many, many blessings. The cool thing, for instance, the, the video you saw this morning from David. You know, he's talking about his business. You know, he's, he did some things. He's serving. God's done some things. He serves here. He's one. He's, he's just an incredible volunteer. But, man, God has blessed him and blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. And I hear people say, man, he sure is lucky. I wish God would bless me like that. I'm like, well, then serve. Be a son. Begin to serve God's purposes. Make everything you do from your business to your activities to your social life. Let it glorify God and see if something doesn't change. Come on, somebody. So he places, that's why he places in a church. And he places in a church. The Bible says he gives us a father, spiritual father, in order to equip us to do the work of the man, to serve in the house as a son. That's, that's the way he does it. So and remember, when we say father or sons in this context, we're not talking about age or gender. You can be young and be a spiritual father. You can be female. Not really, now, I know, I know the theology going around. I know people, women have no business leading. Come on. There's some godly women in the Bible that God used. So it blows my mind that people think what Paul said meant that no woman can ever speak. 
I mean, my wife gives me a lot of wisdom. <laughs> even when I don't appreciate it. <laughs> she see, she see, I tell you how special my wife is. She knows what I'm thinking even when I don't. <laughs> how many men can say amen? amen? Thank God for that. All right, let's go to Romans. Because Paul, you know, Paul was talking to the church of Corinth. Let me, let me, let's move on. In Romans chapter 8, we're going to read a few verses from here. But look at verse 18. Paul says this, I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. Now, this is God, through, you know, by the Holy Spirit, through Paul, tell us what God wants to and how he's going to work through his people and through his church. All right? He says, it will be what? And unveiled within who? Us. Are you in us? Sure, if you're part of the body of Christ. Now, the entire universe, listen to this, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Let me pause real quickly. I don't have time to, uh, if you know what exegesis is, or to exegete scripture, it means to fully break it down. Like we could take this, and we could take a long time and teach this passage. In fact, I did a paper in college on Romans, and I did this passage. It was a 25-page paper. So, I mean, you, and I still didn't cover it all. You know what I'm saying? But, but let me just give you a little something. So where it says, the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Some versions just say sons. I've been telling you, it's both. So when it says sons, it's talking about male and female. So that word unveiling, this is important. That word unveiling is the same word as the word revelation. Same word used to name the last book of the Bible. It, the name of the book officially is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or the revelation about Jesus Christ. So it really means, revelation means the unveiling. So revelation is about how Jesus is unveiled. And it's, if you look, what's it about? It's not just the end times. It's about the church in the end times. So then he says the unveiling. And listen what he says. The glorious sons and daughters. He's saying sons of God, people who are living sons, have a glory on their life. Now, what about where God says, I don't share my glory with any man? Here's the catcher. You ready for this? Here's the deal. But when we are plugged in as sons, we're plugged into the body of Christ. And in that, because the glory is on Jesus, we partake in his glory as part of his body. Come on, somebody. I mean, that'll, that'll preach, and I don't have time to preach it. That's just, that's just a little nugget. So understand, that's what he says in verse 20. For against this will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. In other words, sin happened and all this stuff happened and all the bad stuff's happening. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience us, experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. Listen to this. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in the contractions of labor in childbirth. Now, guys, all we can do is be observers. So, but maybe you've observed that. Maybe you've got kids. And any man who ever watched a woman give birth is a fool if he thinks they aren't tougher than us. But one thing I learned, and I had to be told this and watch this, but the closer that baby gets, the tougher the contractions get. The pain increases. It doesn't get better as the end comes. And so often you hear people today teaching this. Well, it's going to get better and better. And things are going to just, we're just waiting for it to get better. And what's going to, that's not what the Bible says. And I want you to understand something. What Paul is really telling us here that will really help us. If we had time to really break it down, it would help some. But, but I won't take time to go there. But if you would go to Genesis 3, you can read this another time. But Genesis 3 really tells us what Paul's talking about. gives us the first idea. Because this is where Adam and Eve God has to confront them because Adam and Eve sinned and allowed sin into the human race, right? And so he issues, God issues the punishment for their sins, for, for turning their back on him. Now, first, he curses the serpent who is the embodiment of the devil. You know, he, he came as a serpent. He curses him. And we know what the curse was for him to crawl on his belly all days, eat dust, right? And then, then Eve, and her, her curse was pain in childbirth, right? And then having to be subject to her husband, right? So it says that. But then to Adam... He addresses him in a little bit different way. God doesn't just specifically curse Adam in the sense that it's just a few things about him. What he says is uh, Adam's punishment involved all creation. He'll have to work. The ground will have thorns and weeds and, and, and bugs and, and skeeters and, and all the things. How many of us just 
don't mind working. Well, let me say it this way. How many can just shout out something to me that you hate about working outside in Alabama in the middle of the summer? Heat, humidity, bugs, flies, everything you just listed, none of that was in Eden. None of it. Can you imagine tilling your garden and you don't even sweat? You understand there would be no deodorant necessary if Eden hadn't happened, right? If it just stayed the same, if the sin hadn't come. Think about it. All the soap companies wouldn't even exist. You wouldn't need it. Think about how perfect things. Not as no sweat, no bugs, no nasty snakes. Apparently snakes were beautiful. Satan came as a serpent, and, and, he, and his curse was to crawl on his belly, so he must not have been crawling on his belly. I don't know what he was doing. But think about that. As, as, as we look through life, and God's telling this whole thing, here's what he's saying. Write this down. Until sin entered, everything was completely perfect. So let me ask you this. Where had Eden come from? Because, well, God created it. But think about it. If you go to the very beginning of the Bible, it says that everything was what? Somebody said it. Chaos. I heard that word. Chaos. Everything was in chaos. And God spoke, and he began to speak, and he began to call things into order. And when he built the world, spoke it into existence. He did his whole deal with creation. He put man in a place called Eden. And can I tell you, Eden was not given as a reward for those who measure up. It was given as the status quo for how things are supposed to be. Eden was built for the way God intended for the earth to be. But he knew the shortcomings of men. He knew what the devil was going to do even before the devil did it. So he had, he had a contingency. He was ready. But his plan was for every single man, woman, boy, girl who ever lived to live in a place like Eden. So to give the devil a black eye, what he's going to do is he's going to take us back to a place like that. But in the meantime, we have to understand that now when sin entered the world, at that moment, death began to take place. And people say, well, Adam, Adam sinned. The Bible says, God says, you're going to die. Well, he didn't mean you're going to die the second. He said, you've let death into the human race. It would, we would have lived forever. I have no idea how that would have looked. I don't know what would have happened. But I know this. Once sin came in, here's what began to happen. The further we go through time, the faster things spin out of control. And the longer God delays coming, sending Jesus back, the worse it's going to get. You're going to have more earthquakes, more crazy wars, more things. People screaming at the darkness. People screaming at each other. All these diverse, terrible things happening. It's going to get worse and worse. And chaos is trying to take back over. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. Anybody that's preaching to you that things are just going to get better and better and not worse is not reading the whole Bible. Now, the Bible does tell us that there's going to be a stronger church. But that doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily the bigger church. Not, that's not a statement about how big a church is. What I'm saying is it can be stronger, but there may be fewer people who want to join along. Because the Bible says wide is the way that leads to hell and destruction. Not because God wants it to be. That's just what people choose. So here's what we understand. Once sin came in, it begins to bring chaos. And so it's not God that's doing these bad things. It's not God that's causing it. It's society that's turned its back on God. And ever since sin entered the world, Satan has been trying to control everything. The ruler, of the, he's the prince of the power of the air. Things are going crazy. And don't expect it to get better and better and better. Don't be shocked by these things. Because all creation recognizes as bad as it was then, or is now, it was that perfect in Eden. As bad as we all these things. Think about it, That's how perfect it was. That took thousands of years for us to get from Eden to where we are today. We're thousands of years removed from that. And look, sin's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. But i got to tell you something. The Bible says everywhere sin abounds, grace does much more abounds. So God's still able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or imagine. He's still got a plan that just pales in comparison to what we, his plan makes our plans pale in comparison to what he has in mind. We never even thought of all the stuff he's got in mind for us. And yet we so often miss him because we're about our own stuff. Jesus said when you see this happening, what? Panic? Shoot a video and post it somewhere. Tell everybody you know how bad this other person is. No, he says, when you see it happening, look up. Uh-huh. Because your redemption is just around the corner. Get ready. So what is it that it makes us walk in comfort 
and anticipation and peace and, and confidence that God is helping us and we're going to get through this instead of walking in fear and dread. Creation, Paul says, listen, is groaning. Write this down. Is groaning for sons of God to step up into the revelation and power of the Holy Spirit. Not, that's not just about the second coming. That's not just about Jesus coming back and getting us. It's about what we're supposed to do until he does. That as we begin to allow God to reveal us as sons, we're going to be the answer to a broken world. Because we contain Jesus. We are Jesus in him. What I'm saying is the body of Christ. We're his body. So they look to us, and as sons are revealed, that's the hope of the world. That's what creation is looking for. The Bible says they're so excited about it. And so they understand. They're on their tiptoes. I think I see it coming. They're looking. They're yearning. Please, come on. We're ready. And when the sons of God begin to rise up, the Bible says all hell will be cast down. And all of a sudden, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the children of God. Some, that, that should just bless somebody. So what does that mean for us individually? There also in Romans chapter 8. Let me begin to wrap this up. Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God. Listen to this. For all. Say it with me. Who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It's not a club you have to join. There's not a certain level. Some religions... And some cults teach you you have to do certain things to get to the next level. And sometimes it's money, sometimes certain kind of training. But while we believe you're supposed to study to show yourself approved, the Bible says there's only one thing you need to do to become a son. Allow yourself to be what? Led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. All who are led by the Spirit are what? Sons of God. Sons of God. Look, not one of us has the answer that creation's, not one of us, has the answer that creation is longing for. But all of us together, as we step up into the place God has put us and we fulfill God's purposes in our generation, we become the sons of God. And it's in us. Remember we told you last week, we wonder why we have the anointing, we have the same anointing Jesus had. The way we're going to do greater things is because all the fullness of God's glory is all of us together. There are millions of us. All right? There are millions of us. And as, our, as the sons of God step up and are led by the Spirit of God, then hell begins to take notice. That's why Satan fights so hard. He wants to make sure that he stops the church from being grounded in the Word. He wants to stop the church from being connected because he wants, to, wants people to think, oh, it doesn't matter if you go to church or not. It doesn't matter if you're really serving or not. It doesn't matter because he knows when sons begin to step up and it begins to be revealed that all creation is longer for that and they're going to rush to the kingdom of God. And that's what I'm believing for. Can somebody say amen? amen. Everything you need. To rise up as a revealed son can be found in the center of the context of your church. Now I want to look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Y'all just stay with me. I know I to our media team. I'm going to do a little bit different order. That's okay. Stay with me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How much difference would the world be if the church just lived by verse 8? What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, spiritual father, Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says get your mind right, get your heart right, get your focus right, get your priorities right, plug into your church. Listen to me. The devil, the devil knows if he can get us to focus on negative messages, if he can get us to believe the bad stuff and listen to all the talking heads and looking at those clips and looking at the little sound bites and discussing all the bad things that are going on, he knows he's got it. Because if we're walking in hopelessness and fear and worried about the future and trouble, he wins. We have to be led by the Spirit, not the cultural chaos. Write this in your notes. And this, it's before the other one. I know that. Satan's goal is to get you to fear and scream at the darkness. And you know people that are doing that now? God's plan will reveal you as a son. That's the answer to the human predicament. It's what? Son. So the Bible says that's the answer. God's answer of human predicament was a son, not a servant. We read that a few weeks ago. So 
God wants you to understand this. You'll be rise up. You'll be revealed as a son. And that can be found in the context of your church. That's what God wants you to do. Assuming the church is grounded in the word. And if it's not, then you go somewhere else, right? If it's a church that we're a church grounded in the word. I feel like we're being led by the spirit. Then we all have to be led. And it's beyond just simply attending church. It's more than just about if you go to church or not. It's about being sons, putting the kingdom of God first. Here's the point. Sons are God's answer for the longing and groaning of creation. Well, I thought Jesus is the answer. He is. But he's revealed himself through sons. He's revealed himself through his body. There's a reason he calls us the body of Christ on the earth. Because most people have never seen Jesus except maybe a picture of a crucifix or a painting somewhere. They don't really know much about Jesus. So unfortunately, we've painted a really poor picture of him sometimes as a church. Talk about the body of Christ universal. It's time they saw sons of God rising up. Fulfilling their purposes, doing what God's called us to do. Not one of us has the answer, but all of us together, we have it. Come on. We've, look, historically, the church has spent too much time talking about the by and by, one day and the Holy Ghost moves on my life, and one day I, I am saved and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And I, all that's wonderful. And one day I'm going to heaven and I'm going to have a streets of gold and I'm going to have a mansion. Thank God for all that. But there's more to this life than the sweet by and by. I mean, I've sung those songs, Mansion Over the Hilltop. Build my cabin in the corner of glory land. How many have been around long enough to hear that? Okay, praise God for that. But how about what God wants to do on this side? He said, this is not talking about, he's not talking about eternity, about the sons being revealed. He's talking about creation, beginning to see the sons of God revealed in this generation, in this lifetime. We are the generation. We're the ones God wants to use. And we're the ones that are going to rise up and creation is going to say, yes, that's what I'm fa- looking for. And the Bible says in those days, people have been to grab people by the collar and say, take us with you because things are happening. Would you take us to God's house? When the church rises up and does what God's called us to do and the sons are revealed, creation is going to take notice. That's what's going to change our world. We're so busy sometimes as a church trying to fit into culture that we've forgotten that we're supposed to be change agents. Last verse, then we're done. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be... Listen, this is what it takes. He said, you do these things, then I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says God Almighty. God's looking for sons. He's looking for sons. I don't think we're supposed to be so crazy that we chase people away. But at the same time, God's looking for somebody with backbone. Some of us say, it's okay to take a stand. It's okay. In fact, God asked us to be holy. He said, how about embracing me instead of culture? How about listening to my lifestyle? What about if I just lead you in what you're supposed to do instead of arguing amongst yourselves and fighting on the Internet and doing all the things that are going on? How about if the sons of God just begin to join together and find their place in the house of God and let me move through them and let me begin to reveal my purpose through them? Folks, I want to be part of that. And that's what he's calling us to. Would you stand to your feet right now? If you say, Pastor, I want to be part of God's plan. I, want, I don't want this to be about me. I don't want it to be my show. You know, we say that all the time, but the truth is, the only way it's going to happen is when we all step in and say, I want to be a son. You place me here for your purpose, and together, we are going to be the body of Christ together. Amen. Would you raise your hands if you agree with that? Let me pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I speak life and peace and purpose in Jesus' name. Lord, you've called us here not to just fill a Sunday morning. Lord, we have plenty to do. Lord, there's a purpose in what you're doing. There's a reason we have a church. There's a reason you've gathered us together. There's a plan you have that you plan us here. And God, we're going to fulfill our place. We're going to find our, our, our part that we're supposed to do. We're going to do our share. And when we work together, those things work together are going to reveal Feel your purpose to a generation that's lost and hungry and desperate for a genuine move of your spirit. Lord, it's going to happen through us. And we say, even so, Lord, do it now. Do it now. In Jesus' name, give him a shout of praise. Say, I'm the one. Amen. Let's worship together. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you'll tune in next time. If you want more information 
about Praise Family Church, or if you think you might like to visit us sometimes, you can find out a lot of information at praisefamily.church. Maybe you'd like to partner with us to make these broadcasts possible. You can text the word GIVING to 313131, or you can mail an offering to the address you see on the screen. But whatever you do, we want to continue to be a blessing to you. We want to be a help to you. And we want to let you see that God has got great things in store for you. And he has a plan for your life. We hope you'll continue to tune in and you'll be a part as Praise Family Church continues to tell the good news around the world.